All right, well, great. Thank you so much. It's a tremendous honor to be here to represent Class One um, and, and to be at this, um, at this event. Um, so as I was thinking about how to start my talk, I was thinking about how my younger self, you know, my, my childhood self would view me being here now. And um, I think she would be really surprised uh, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, because um, my younger self knew nothing about science. So growing up, my family has no technical people at all, uh, no scientists, no engineers, no doctors, um, they, no one of any, um, with that bent at all. Um, and so as a child, I really didn't know much about what a career in science would be like. In fact, um, my parents are quite politically active. And so I remember when I was in fifth grade, um, I, there was a debate in my school and, and I played Geraldine Ferraro. And after that, my objective, um, my goal in life was to be the first female president. Um, so obviously that didn't work out. <laughs> I guess there's still time, but, um, but, um, but so, so anyway, so it, it, is, um, it is actually, you know, really through um, having, um, and, and I'm sure that many people feel the same way, having amazing teachers, I had an amazing chemistry teacher in high school, I had amazing mentors throughout college and graduate school and, um, and my postdoc in order to, to get to where I am today, which is as a, as a scientist, in particular as a chemist. Um, and so what we do in my lab, uh, the research that we focus on is, is making molecules. And so I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about how you would think about making molecules, or at least how, how my family, who are not scientists at all, what, what they think of when they think about making molecules, if they think about it at all. Um, and, and I think that most people, you know, when you think about making molecules, you probably think about something like this. So if you're driving up and down 95 on the East Coast, you might go through Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, if you live in the Midwest, you might go through somewhere like Gary, Indiana. Um, and you would see these sort of facilities, huge facilities, um, where really all of the molecules that we use in modern life are, are, are made in facilities like this. And so um, just to, to give you an idea about the kind of things that are made in these types of chemical manufacturing facilities, um, things like gasoline, um, plastics, fertilizers, um, and all sorts of, of life-saving pharmaceuticals, um, agrochemicals, et cetera, are made in these, in these types of facilities. And so um, the synthesis of molecules, the making of molecules, the um, synthetic chemistry is really central to modern society. And this is reflected, and I think if you've passed any of these facilities, you probably have a pretty good sense of this. This is reflected in the amount of energy that this enterprise uses. So just a recent estimate um, suggests that the, the synthesis of molecules um, as part of our domestic energy usage annually is more than 10%. So this is a huge amount of energy that goes every year to making the things that we use every day. Um, in addition, if, again, if you've passed these facilities, you probably can smell that they don't smell so good. Um, you've heard about uh, you know, chemicals spilling into the environment in all kinds of places as a result of chemical manufacturing. And so there's a lot of waste that's generated, often toxic waste that's generated as part of these processes. And so what really got me excited about chemistry when I started um, as, a, as a college student were two things. So first of all, there's this potential to have a really great impact on society. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit um, more throughout the talk, um, by, by impacting the amount of energy consumption that goes into making molecules, uh, the amount of waste that comes out of making molecules. Um, and secondly, um, and, and I think that, that for many of the, us this is true, that really the fundamental aspects were really interesting too. How do bonds form? How do bonds break? How do we understand the mechanisms by which molecules get put together and taken apart? Um, so as a synthetic chemist then, we tend to think about sort of overarching goals of synthetic chemistry. And so I want to tell you the sort of our overarching goals and then give you a very specific example from my research of how we try to meet them. Um, so again, what we're trying to do is, is make molecules, build bonds between atoms and molecules. And so I show you here just a very stylized picture of two molecules um, that we would want to react to form some kind of chemical bond. And so in the process of this kind of reaction, as we're designing a reaction to make a plastic or a pharmaceutical or, um, or, or a petroleum product, uh, what we want to do is use as safe and readily available starting materials as we can. We want to minimize the energy input that's required for these transformations. Um, and we want to minimize the waste that comes out. Um, and if we can do this um, as efficiently as possible, we can really impact uh, both the energy input um, as well as the, the chemical waste associated with, with chemical processes. And so again, what I thought I would do is give you a very specific example of, um, from my lab of a reaction that we have worked to develop. What this is going to be is an example that really starts at a very fundamental chemistry question, but then ultimately has, I think, applications in a variety of different, um, different areas, which I'll show you about in, in a second. Okay, so the reaction that we're interested in then, 
or that we'll talk about today, is the formation of a carbon-fluorine bond. So the formation of a bond between a carbon atom and a fluorine. And this kind of bond is incredibly important, incredibly uh, valuable, uh, because a carbon-fluorine bond has really unique properties relative to other types of bonds that are in molecules. So for example, carbon-fluorine bonds are extremely strong, and so when you put them into a plant or into a human, um, a molecule that contains this kind of bond, it typically is metabolized very slowly, if at all. And so if you want to have a drug that will circulate in your body for a long time, this is an extremely important kind of bond to incorporate into that molecule. And so you can see, here's just some examples of some common pharmaceuticals, Lipitor, Flovent, something like 30 to 40% of pharmaceuticals contain this type of bond as a consequence of this sort of important and unique property. Another really important property of carbon fluorine bonds is, is manifest in Teflon, which also contains this type of bond. Um, these are extremely, they generate materials that are extremely hydrophobic. Um, and so when you put a drop of water on your Teflon pan or you cook in your Teflon pan, the reason that things don't stick to it is again related to this carbon fluorine bond. And finally, if anyone in your family or you have ever gone to get a positron, uh, uh, um, ha have um, had positron emission tomography imaging of some part of your body, um, there's a really, really good chance that, um, that that was done with a molecule that contains a carbon fluorine bond because the radioisotope of fluorine, F18, um, has perfect properties for this type of, of imaging application. And so for all these reasons, this is an incredibly industrially, incredibly um, sort of relevant kind of bond. Uh, but our interest in it um, really stems from a much more fundamental question, which I'll get to in a second. Okay, so if you want to develop then a reaction to do this, um, I just put on here sort of the requirements that we'd like to, um, that we'd like to adhere to. So we'd like to have readily available, non-toxic, safe starting materials, um, put minimal energy input and get out as, as little waste as possible to form these important bonds for all of these kinds of applications. And this is really where the, ch where the challenge comes, because it turns out that these types of bonds are difficult to make. Um, uh, it, 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 typically, you will either have starting materials um, that are very reactive, and this is typically how they're made industrially today. So using, using things like hydrogen fluoride, a very toxic chemical, or fluorine gas, again, a very toxic chemical, um, um, very reactive chemicals to form these types of bonds. Um, and if you take readily available, non-toxic, and safe starting materials and try to form this type of bond, typically the, the starting materials just sort of sit around, float in solution, and don't react with one another. Okay, so what we work on then is to try to figure out ways to implement this, this type of process. Again, using readily available starting materials, starting materials that are, are safe, are, are not toxic, to form this type of bond. And, and the way that we do this is by developing metal-based catalysts. Okay? And so what the metal catalyst is going to do is enable this, this type of transformation by acting as, as um, a good way to think about it as sort of as a, as a matchmaker for these two molecules. So again, these two molecules are sort of floating in solution. Um, they're not really interacting with, other, with, with one another. You know, they're sort of in their own separate lives. Um, and so what this, what this catalyst does then is, is bring these molecules together, um, bring the, the carbon and the fluorine together in a way that now they can interact and, and hopefully ultimately form a bond, just as a, as a matchmaker would like to do for people. Um, so this is sort of shown in, a, in a, again, a stylized version here, uh, where, again, we've got this metal catalyst, which takes these two starting materials, hopefully, again, readily available and safe starting materials, um, brings them together in really close proximity, um, and then we'd really like them to then couple together, form this, this key bond of this, um, of this product. Now, the challenge here, and again, this is really the fundamental chemistry challenge associated with this whole problem, is that this approach, this transition metal catalyst, it works great for lots of other bond-forming reactions. But in this particular case, um, it, for 30 years, people have been trying to do this, and they couldn't get it to happen. Um, and so we were particularly interested in one metal, palladium, but this, people have looked at this with lots of other metals as well. And, and what people have found is that even when you bring these together, even when the matchmaker sort of brings these two molecules in close proximity to one another, attaches them to this palladium with a plus two charge associated with it, um, the, the bond wouldn't form. And so this would sit in solution, and there was just, there was just it, it needed some more impetus to actually, to actually get, these two, um, get these two atoms to combine together. And so again, people had thought about this for 30 years, really hadn't been able to solve this problem. And so our hypothesis when we entered this field was a very fundamental one. Um, we thought that if perhaps we could excite this molecule in some way, um, and, 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 um, and uh, that we might be able to, to get the carbon and the fluorine to couple together and actually form the bond that we wanted. And the way that we thought about exciting this was to um, do what we would call an oxidation. So we're gonna remove electrons from the palladium center. 
I just show you this here, um, by uh, taking out two electrons and generating a palladium that now goes from a plus two charge to a plus four charge. And we hypothesized that this excitation, this removal of electrons would generate a much more reactive molecule that could then form the key bond in question. So what was the challenge here? Well, the challenge here was that when we sort of proposed this, when I, when I went out on the job market and proposed this in, in various uh, forums, um, what people told me, many, many uh, sort of well-renowned chemists told me, is that this type of um, palladium, palladium in the plus four charge, plus four oxidation state, just wasn't feasible, wasn't possible, and that we wouldn't be able to access this reactive intermediate in order to be able to form this bond. Um, so we wrote an NSF grant, um, started very fundamental research to just try to understand if this was possible, and ultimately we were able to demonstrate that in fact you could access palladium in this plus four oxidation state, and that it was uniquely capable of forming this key carbon fluorine bond that we want to be able to do um, in, in these chemical processes. And these are just some examples of some X-ray crystal structures of molecules that, that contain palladium. So the palladium is in the center here and in the center here uh, with this plus four oxidation state, which was, again, what people had speculated previously wouldn't be accessible. Um, furthermore, we were able to demonstrate that once you get to this palladium in the plus four oxidation state, you actually could do this coupling reaction to form the bond that we were interested in. So this was really exciting, uh, stimulated a lot of effort, a lot of interest in the field, um, ultimately led to a number of different processes for forming carbon uh, fluorine bonds catalyzed by palladium. Um, and this stimulated interest from a number of different industries. Um, so again, very fundamental research, but ultimately led to a, some really, I think, exciting applications. So again, we were working in the lab just in, in small flasks like this, doing small scale reactions, um, but we got contacted by Dow Chemical, which is just up the road from us, who said that they were really interested in the possibility of, of using this type of approach to make the carbon fluorine bonds of agrochemicals, in particular, a herbicide that they were interested in producing on huge scale. In addition, we got contacted by the medical imaging department of our medical school, the radiology department, and they said they were really interested in using this approach to form the carbon fluorine bonds in pet tracers that they would then use to image um, human brains. And so um, both of these uh, industries saw the potential applications of this very fundamental research, uh, but they were both concerned about one thing, and that was the palladium. Um, so from the perspective of the agrochemical industry, palladium is a precious metal, and they really didn't want to have to use a lot of palladium in an industrial process. That was just too expensive, cost prohibitive for what they wanted to do. Um, the people that were interested in medical imaging had different concerns. Their concern was specifically related to the toxicity of a heavy metal and the fact that these imaging agents are made quickly and then rapidly put into people, and so you really need to have a metal or use reagents that are as non-toxic as possible for this type of application. And so the next thing we needed to do was figure out how to translate the studies that we had done with palladium to a metal catalyst that would be much less toxic than the palladium is. And so we thought a lot about this, did a number of experiments, um, and what we wanted to do was use the same approach where we would take the metal, we would assemble the molecules, use it as a matchmaker to put the molecules together, um, and then withdraw electrons, remove electrons from the system in order to couple the carbon and the fluorine together. And so ultimately what we were able to discover is that we could move to copper. So copper is a, is a metal that is common in biology, is commonly used in biology, um, and, and uh, enabled, um, enabled this chemistry to go by accessing a copper three intermediate, another very reactive intermediate, very similar to the palladium in the plus four oxidation state. Um, and so now we have a really active collaboration with Peter Scott in our medical school at the University of Michigan where we're make, using this copper catalyzed carbon fluorine bond formation to make a variety of medical imaging agents. Um, and we also are actively collaborating with Dow to use these type of processes to, um, to generate um, several, several different um, um, biologically active molecules for the, for the, um, for the uh, agrochemical sector. Okay, so this just kind of gives you a snapshot of the kind of ways that we go about developing these types of reactions. Um, so again, starting from basic research, but really transitioning into applications by taking advantage of this sort of matchmaker ability of these transition metal catalysts. And so I just wanted to finish by showing you a couple of other examples of the kind of things that we, that we do. Um, this, uh, this, um, th this kind of approach can be applied not just to carbon fluorine bond formation, but to all sorts of other chemical processes as well. Um, so in this particular case, um, uh, you know, we, what we'd like to be able to do is take carbon dioxide, right? So this is a gas that's emitted. Um, it it is, is leading to, um, to, to sort of catastrophic 
um, global warming. Um, and so what we'd like to be able to do is use this type of transition metal catalysis, use these type of transition metals to combine CO2 with hydrogen and actually regenerate fuels and chemicals from CO2. And so we have a, a pretty active research program that's working on, again, using this, this, this same um, sort of approach to take these two molecules, which are pretty unreactive on their own, and getting them to combine together by, by taking advantage of the matchmaker properties of these catalysts. Um, we have other applications of this, this type of approach where we use transition metal catalysts to make new drug scaffolds and drug-like scaffolds. Um, here what we're doing is using very unreactive starting materials, starting materials that contain carbon-hydrogen bonds, and leveraging the properties of the transition metal uh, catalyst um, in order to selectively transform this carbon-hydrogen bond into a new functional group. And then finally, we have a really active program on developing materials for grid-scale energy storage that, again, takes advantage of the properties of these transition metals where you can with withdraw electrons, um, put electrons back in reversibly and easily in the same way that I showed you with the palladium where we take the electrons out to induce the chemical reaction. Um, and the, the great thing about this is it allows us to reversibly store energy from, for example, solar panels or wind panels um, in, in, um, in what's called a redox flow battery. So I'm going to just conclude by thanking the people that actually, um, you know, really were the engine behind this work. Um, so as you all know, right, that much of this work is, is not done by me. And so I have an amazing group of current coworkers. This is just a reunion of some, some prior coworkers. We have an incredibly diverse group, both um, international, um, many, many different um, ethnicities, races, genders, um, and, and um, just an incredible international group of, of scholars that work on this problem. And as I told you at the beginning, um, uh, when I started um, my independent career, um, when I started in college, I had no idea that I wanted to be a chemist. And I think that one of the great things about my job is the opportunity to train these amazing students um, and show them what it's like to have a life as a scientist and how great it is to have a life as a scientist so that they can potentially choose that for themselves. Um, so I want to thank you again for the opportunity to re represent class one, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. <laughs>That's a great question. So, so what, ha what had happened was that um, uh, there had been a number of previous, um, so, so, so um, in the chemical literature there had been a number of proposals um, about the mechanisms of reaction that had proposed palladium for previously. And almost all of them had been sort of definitively proven to be incorrect. And so there was kind of a dogma out there that anyone that proposed palladium-4 was then subsequently going to be proven wrong. So I think that it was less about anything specific about the orbitals or the, or the um, characteristics of palladium that wouldn't allow that oxidation to be, state to be accessible, and more a question of um, people had been proposed it previously and that had subsequently been shown to be incorrect and that there were actually other mechanisms that were going on. And so there was sort of a feeling that anyone that proposed this was going to be wrong. Um, and it was a kind of a dangerous thing to propose because if you proposed it, you were ultimately going to get proven wrong. So that, that's, that's, I think, really where that feeling came from. Okay. Well, let's, let's thank Melanie again. That's wonderful.